womb transplant in the life of a woman. Births resulting from uterus transplants have been happening since 2014, from alive donors for women otherwise unable to conceive because of uterine problems. The Lancet reports that uterus can be successfully preserved and transplanted from a deceased person, this could relax the supple bottleneck. A woman in Brazil has successfully given birth on 15 December 2017, by cesarean section after receiving a womb from a dead donor, the first time such a procedure has been successful. The transplanted uterus was removed from the mother during the delivery. What made the birth unique was that the child had been gestated in a womb transplanted from a 45-year-old woman, who died from a burst blood vessel in the brain, and had previously given birth three times. The recipient was a 32-year-old born with a condition called myrokitansky custer horser syndrome. It affects 1 in 4,500 women and means that the womb fails to develop. It is a good news for women who, because of injury, illness, hysterectomy or congenital conditions, would need a transplant in order to bear a child. But some bioethicists point to risks of complications for the recipient and the fetus as well as the high cost. Some question whether these drawbacks are outweighed by the benefits when the alternative of surrogacy exists, although that of course has its own problems, and it would be naive to draw an equivalence between them. But uterus transplants also raise complicated questions for feminism. Sharona Pearl, a theorist says, there is a feminist position that supports the uterus transplant, arguing that it allows women, to be included in an experience that is, for some, central to and defining of femaleness. But, that is part of the problem, the uterus transplant supports the social norm of pregnancy as fundamental to being a woman. Uterus transplants imply that the risks of the procedure are worth it, in order to fulfill women's alleged biological destiny as carriers of future children. Ever since the early discussions of assisted reproductive technologies such as IVF in the 1920s, there have been split opinion about the implications for gender roles and female choices in particular. The idea promoted then by biologists such as J.B.S. Haldane of gestation in artificial wombs, ectogenesis, was welcomed by progressives as an emancipating technology that would free women from the duties of childbearing and the associated constraints on opportunity. In the 1970s, Sheila Mayth Firestone, author of The Dialectic of Sex, was an enthusiastic advocate of ectogenesis for those reasons, saying that only by being relieved of responsibility for childbearing could women hope for social equality. Some feared that an artificial womb would sever the mother-child bond and deprive women of their role. Robin Rowland, a sociologist wrote, If that last power is taken and controlled by men, what role is envisaged for women in the new world? IVF itself has elicited similar concerns. For all that it offers some women their only chance of pregnancy and childbirth. It can seem too much like the commodification of a woman's body by a male-dominated techno-elite. In the mid-1980s, the German radical feminist group Rodzora bombed IVF clinics and stole documents, while the feminist network Feminist International Network of Resistance to Reproductive and Genetic Engineering has long expressed skepticism about assisted reproductive technology from feminist and socialist perspectives. Fears a danger as with objections to uterus transplants, that, as social historian Naomi Pfeffer has charged, the critics consult the views of all women except those who actually suffer from infertility. But it's quite right that advances in assisted reproductive technologies be interrogated as much more than neutral medical options. By making pregnancy potentially available to trans women and even to cis men, with hormone treatments, Uterus transplants could challenge social norms and preconceptions, just as IVF has done by creating new family structures. But equally, by insisting on a particular route to motherhood these transplants could reinforce those norms and stereotypes, just as anthropologist Sarah Franklin has argued that anxieties about IVF have motivated social conformity in the way it is presented and practiced.
Few issues are more emotive than conception and child rearing, but that's precisely because there are no easy answers. Hope they can be discussed frankly, tolerantly and with compassion. Thank you.